Hey, we're back at it for some more. We are in the book of Luke and we are hitting one chapter today, Luke chapter 13. So get away with the Lord, take your time, read with purpose, just be so still in his presence and let something beautiful happen in your life. Take your time. This is about you and God first. Before anything else happens, make it about you and God. So go after him. Go after him hard. Seek him with all that you are and watch things be stirred up with any. Watch things change right before your eyes. Let's let him have his way. Let's let him move. So excited about what he has planned for this chapter in our lives. Let's do this thing. Read. Take your time. Take as long as you need. Do not close that Bible up until you have met with the Lord. Then jump back on here with me and we'll walk this thing out together. Father, I pray that you seal up this time. Lord, that you seal us up, that there is a seal made by your blood, the power of your blood that keeps all distractions out, that keeps the lies and the deceit, the, the assaults of the enemy out from this time. Lord, we are pressing in. We are going after you. I pray that you seal this time up with the power of your Holy Spirit, that you be our defense, that you be our rock, that you provide for us this time of stillness and quietness in you. Lord, we are not going after the blessing of this. We are going after our blesser, the one who blesses, the one who loves. Lord, I want to know more of you. I want to know more of your heart. So Father, be here with us. Take us on an adventure with you. Lord, we love you and we we just want you, you working, you moving, you being all over this. Father, we want to see you in your glory. Show us your glory today as we walk through your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 13. Okay, let's see what God has for us. Okay, this lays out, um, man, the importance of repentance. So this is, is kind of just expressing sins, expressing, hey, what's the greater sin? Who's the greatest sinner? What's the worst thing to do? And God just brings it back every time. It's about repentance. It's not about these levels of sins. It's not about what you think is worse. It's not about all the things you've done. It's not about the things someone else has done compared to you. This is about repentance. I don't care. I don't care what anyone's past looks like. I care about right now what they're doing right now. If they are repenting, if they have turned to me, if they are seeking me, I don't care what they've done. I care right now if they're responding to me or not. Are you rejecting or accepting the Lord right now? Are you going to him in humility, in repentance, receiving all that he is, seeing him as your salvation, letting him restore and heal you? What are you doing now? God is after repentance. Verse three, we see, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It comes down to repentance. Everyone's gonna perish. Everyone will die because his word says, for the wages of sin is death. Our punishment because of sin is death. And we are all sinners. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have all, we have all walked away from the Lord from his holiness, from, from his salvation. We have, we have walked away in some form or another and have sinned. Every single one of us, not one of us has not sinned. Therefore, every single one of us deserves to die. And the Lord says, every single one of us will die unless we repent. He says it again in verse five, um, after they bring up and say, hey, which one's worse? Which sin is worse? Verse five, I tell you, <clears throat> but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's about repentance. It's about who is going to truly seek the Lord, who is going to truly turn away from their sins and run to the Lord. Who is going to repent? Because unless we repent, we all will die. Verse six, and he began telling this parable, a man had a fig tree, which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. So this fig tree that should be producing figs is not producing any fruit. So it's worthless. It's it's not worth anything. Needs to be cut down. And that's what he says. He says, behold, for three years, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? If it's a waste of space, it's it needs to be cut down. It needs to be thrown out. What are we living for? 
what do our lives, what are our lives screaming? Are we living in purpose? Are we living purposeful lives? Are we reading the word in a purposeful way? Are we seeking after the things that matter? Because if we are, then fruit will be produced. The world will see fruit. We know who each individual is and what they're living for by their fruit. If their fruit is ripe and sweet and large and tasty, or if there's no fruit at all, or if it grows and then it rots, it, it's, it's that fruit. What, what is being produced out of the lives that we are choosing to live? Um, verse eight says, and he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too. So give it one more year. He said, I've come back three years and no fruit, cut it down. It's a waste of space. And, and the, the gentleman says, let it alone, sir, for this year too, one more year until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. So let's give it, let's give it one more chance. Let's give one more opportunity. Let's bring about judgment to see if it awakens them to their need of a savior, that it throws them into repentance. It drives them and leads them back into the Lord in repentance. Let's see what this does. This one last thing does. Love this. He says, I'll dig around it and put in fertilizer. Put in what is going to cause it to grow. You know what causes us to grow? You know what causes growth? Brings about these growth opportunities. Really, 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 really hard times. Really hard times. Why did God come in the judgment that he did in the Old Testament? It wasn't to destroy. It was to refine. It was to restore. It was to give opportunity for them to come back to the Lord. That's why that's that's done. And he says, one more year. Give it one more year. I'm going to dig around it. I'm going to put fertilizer in it. We're going to present more opportunities for them to see if they come back to repentance. Then he says in verse 9, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. That's how God, that's how God operates. Let's not wait until that very last time, that very last opportunity. Let's choose to see every opportunity that we have and grab a hold of it and run with it with so much faith, with so much fervency, with so much passion, with so much purpose. Let's grab a hold of every opportunity that God gives us and run with it with purpose. Okay. Then we see Jesus healing on the Sabbath. He is so good at healing on the Sabbath. So it talks about this woman who for 18 years, it says, had a sickness caused by a spirit and she was doubled over. She could not straighten up her back. Because of a spirit, this sickness was upon her. She could not straighten up. Verse 12, when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her. One touch of Jesus himself. And immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. Just like that, one touch of Jesus saying, you are free from your sickness and she stands upright. She can straighten up her back because she had an encounter with her healer. Verse 14, but the synagogue official indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath. And Jesus then responded to this this cry out to the crowds and reminding them, hey, we don't do this on the Sabbath. This, This isn't gonna be tolerated. And Jesus says in verse 15, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? So Jesus calls them, calls them out and saying, you are hypocrites. When your ox and your donkey are bound up, do you not untie them and lead them to the stall? He says, how much more should I heal this woman? How much more should I care about this woman? that you were willing to unbound, un- unbind your ox and donkey. I'm gonna unbind this woman from this grip that, that the enemy has upon her. I will unbind her. I will remove these chains from her. I don't care if it's the Sabbath or not. Jesus is saying, I'm here and I'm loving on people and I'm caring about people. And the Sabbath isn't about that you're not supposed to do good. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. That's what it's about. 
Jesus is here doing his thing, living on purpose and loving people no matter what, no matter who is saying what. He's going to love on people. And he called them out, called them hypocrites. And it says that they were humiliated in front of the entire crowd. And they began rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. The crowd sees them being humiliated and just giving glory and honor to the Lord in all the things that he is doing, the way that he is healing, the way he is just being Jesus. Verse 18. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? So this takes us to Matthew 13, where we read about this, what Jesus compares the kingdom of God to. And he says in verse 19, a mustard seed, where he throws it the smallest seed, yet it grows into this very large plant, larger than all the others around it. And it provides shade and it provides all these things for the animals. So what it is revealed to the kingdom of God, it reveals it reveals the true hearers, the true seekers. It reveals those who are rejecting the Lord, not truly believing in him. He says the same thing we read in Matthew 13 as well. In verse 21, we read the same message. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. So all leavened, it's hidden, but what is hidden, what is done in secret will be exposed, will be revealed. And that is Jesus coming in not to bring peace, but to divide, to bring division, to bring this sword that reveals those who seek the Lord and those who reject him. Those, all, all that's real, it's going to be brought to light. All that's done in darkness, those things are going to be brought to light. Jesus is getting down to the bottom of it and he's bringing out the real. Whether, whether we want that real exposed or not, it's going to be exposed. So why not live our lives completely transparent, completely just, just, in, in authenticity all the way, complete surrender, not caring about what people will say or think or do, just being real, just putting it out there and not lifting ourselves up, just being real and vulnerable and lifting the name of the Lord up. Verse 23, and someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to him, verse 24, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So he says, strive. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door. This is a narrow door. It's not going to be easy to get through. Not everyone will. Not many, not many will strive to enter through the narrow door. This word strive translates to to struggle, to fight, to labor fervently. Now, what I love about this, this word strive always is like, mm, like, don't like the word strive. God's not about our striving, our doing, our getting so, you know, into accomplishments. I love this though, that this word even translates to labor fervently, to struggle, to fight. Like we can read this and just see, oh, it's just about a bunch of doing. No, totally not about doing. Our struggle, our fight, understanding that this is not this is not an easy task. And I love reading the word of God. This is why you cannot take scriptures out of context. Jesus is not saying work really, really hard and do a bunch of really good deeds so that you can squeeze through this narrow way. We know that Jesus is not about doing all of this stuff. We've read it chapter after chapter about God and this is his work and pulling back from this physical and the material stuff that we can do, not to worry about the things that we need provided for us, but preparing, being dressed in readiness, being prepared for eternity. It's the things of the heart. It's the things of just being close to the Lord. This isn't about what we can do and making it through this narrow way. It's about struggling and fighting and getting down to living with purpose, meaning our hearts being cleaned, our minds being renewed. That's not easy. That's a struggle. That's a fight that we have to fight off. We have to fight against these thoughts of the flesh. We have to fight against the emotions that stir up within our heart to labor fervently. That's a daily pursuit of the Lord. That's keeping that candle lit that keeping our lamps lit, keeping them burning continually, dressed in readiness, it takes some discipline. It takes some purpose. It takes some intentionality. It takes some focus. We've got to be fervent in our pursuit of the Lord. Jesus isn't saying, do a bunch of stuff, do a bunch of serve, serve, do, do, do more for me. No, he's saying, you work hard. You, It's not easy it's not easy to be set apart. Your fight and seeking after me, it's not easy. Sometimes you're not going to want to read the word. Sometimes you're not going to feel like it. You're going to be tired. 
you're, you're going to be busy. You're going to get to the end of the day and be exhausted. But you know what? Get in the word and believe what God says. Believe what this, what kind of power and, and rest this brings. His truth brings. It's not going to be easy. God says, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to step out in obedience. You're going to have to enter into things that aren't comfortable, that aren't convenient for you. But you seek after me and your reward will be rich. It'll be something that cannot be compared to anything that the world can offer. Strive to enter through the narrow door. And right here, Jesus says, many will seek to enter. Many, many will come after. Many will want to make it through. And many will not be able. Many won't be able because they will get caught up in doing, doing, doing instead of being and knowing and connecting and having that real, intimate, connected relationship with the Lord. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. Verse 25. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us. So he's saying strive to make it through that narrow way because there will be a time when it's shut. When the Lord comes back, when, when we, when we, when we die, when we pass away and we stand before the Lord, that's it. What we have decided and how we've lived our life up to that point, it's on right then and there. And it says, Um, When the door is shut and we say, Lord, open up to us, there will be many. um, He is talking about these many who seek to enter, but won't be able to. And he says, these people will say, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers that they will say, we ate and drank in your presence. God, we went to church every Sunday. God, we were in Bible studies. God, we talked about you. We were in a prayer group. There are going to be people, good people, who will be speaking those kinds of things. We were in church. Lord, we sat with you at your table. We sat in your presence. We were exposed to all of these good things. You taught in our streets. You came. You spoke. That, that you, there were so many good words that were spoken in church. You spoke through so many men, so many things. I went to so many conferences. I heard you spoke, you showed up, you poured out. God, we, I was there. I was there in your presence. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. This is why we got to take this seriously. It's not about who's going to church, who's involved in all of these Christian religious activities, Who's reading their Bible? Who's praying? No. Who knows the Lord? Who is intimately connected to him? Who has a relationship with the Lord? Who hangs out with the Lord? Who thinks about the Lord? Who just talks to the Lord even when they don't need anything? Who's praising the Lord even when they're going through really hard times? Who is doing this thing with purpose? Who's doing this thing being real? Taking this seriously, not just doing it to do it, not just doing it because the Bible says we should. Who's doing it because they love God, because they desire to know more of him, because they want to go deeper, because they get that nothing else, nothing hold, nothing else holds that much treasure, that much purpose, that much life, that much anything. Who just wants God? Who's doing this thing with purpose? There will be those who are good, who are involved in so many things, who have been exposed by the, by the Spirit and the presence of God so often. Yet the Lord will say, I do not know you. That they never truly connected. There was never that real, that real connection. There was no real relationship that was happening. Nothing happened when everyone else left. Nothing happened when the conferences were done. Nothing happened in the middle of the week after church. Nothing happened when, when no one was supporting them or encouraging them or saying, hey, get in your word today. When, all, when, when everyone went to bed, when all the lights went out, when all the doors were shut, when no one was around, what then? Were you connected to the Lord then? Or did that connection only take place when people were seen or people acknowledged? Jesus is saying there are going to be so many who he says, depart from me. I never knew you. Verse 28, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. 
and they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. The humble, there will be those who humble or there, there will be those who are proud who will be humbled. And there, there will be those who have humbled themselves who will be lifted up. Jesus says, this is what it is. It's one or the other. It's life or death. It's light or darkness. It's heaven or hell. It's with me or apart from me. One or the other. Okay. Um, then the Pharisees are speaking to him. Go away. Leave here. Speaking of, of hey, you know, we're, we're wanting to kill you. You're wanting to be, or you're, you're going to be destroyed. We don't want you around us. And Jesus says in verse 32, and he said to them, go and tell that fox. Tell Herod. They say, Herod wants to kill you. Go and tell that fox. This is what Jesus says. Calls him a fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day, I reach my goal. The third day, this translates to I am perfected. Jesus knows who he is. He knows who his father is. He knows his purpose. He knows why he, why he is here. He doesn't get unraveled. He doesn't get upset. He isn't full of fear. He is set on his father's will. He is set living out his purpose. He is here loving and walking and talking among the people that he is here to save. Okay, uh, verse 33. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. So Jesus is speaking Jerusalem. Jerusalem, this city that I have chosen, that you are against the prophets. You are against truth. You turn your back against the things that matter. And then Jesus, we see that that we see him loving the city expressing his desire to want to keep them safe, to want to love them, to want to care for them, to want to bless them, but they would not have it. They continue to reject him. They turn away from him. They say, no thanks, we don't want to be blessed. We don't want peace. We don't want life. We don't want you. We don't want to be saved. Jesus says, is expressing his desire and saying, oh, how I wanted to bring you close to me, how I wanted to restore and heal you, but you continue to say no. Then he says in verse 35, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is what I love about cross references. This is what I love about the word of God. You can read something. It can sound great. It can sound awesome. You're thinking, okay, the next time they see him, this is what they're going to say. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Back in Psalms. Now, I didn't know this until I looked over at the cross references, but Psalms 118, 26. Never picked up on this before. But this speaks these words where there is it's this um, Psalms 118 is this chapter full of just praises to the Lord, thanking him, lifting him up, bringing glory to the Lord. And this phrase is written in there. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Talking about Jesus, the Messiah, praising him, um, understanding, recognizing that, that, that he has a plan, that he is in control, that he loves, that he gives, that he sends, that God is at work. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Also, what we haven't hit in yet, but there's a passage in Matthew and a passage um, further on in the book of Luke that we're in now that speaks of this beautiful, beautiful time. And we're so familiar of it. It always comes up I feel like in in Easter and celebrating Easter and and the um in in that time when Jesus comes riding on a donkey the colt of a donkey so this young donkey riding in as king and and the people all around have palm branches and they're yelling out hosanna 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 um speaking this shouting this with palm branches this is a time of celebrating the king as he is riding in on this donkey, and in that same phrase, in that same time frame, what they also shout is, along with Hosanna, is blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Never registered, never picked up um, before. You know, we always say Hosanna, Hosanna is the king, Hosanna is, is he right, coming and riding in on a donkey. But in that time, 
that same time frame, they also are shouting out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus says, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say those words. When you are celebrating me, which is right before Jesus then is crucified. We're just a short period after they are speaking Hosanna to the king. Hosanna is he riding in on a donkey and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A short time after, the same people are yelling crucify, crucify him. Oh, but Jesus, Jesus and his steadiness and his consistency of loving those who reject and hate him. That's Jesus. That's the heart of God. That he comes and did not did not say, okay, I'm going to save. I'm going to, I'm going to die for those who will accept me. No, he says, I'm going to die for those who will continue to reject me, who will continue to not believe in me, who will continue to hate me. I'm going to die for all of them because I love them. Jesus isn't saying, I'm only going to die. I'm only going to lay my life down. I'm only going to love those who accept me. No, he's saying, it's on. And I've come to save and save the world. That I, I am opening myself up and giving them access, giving anyone access who desires the life that I am coming to lay down for them to live in. Oh, the heart of God, the heart of our Savior, that's who we serve. That's, that's, that's who loves us. That's who saves us. Okay, uh, beautiful. Just beautiful. So much power, so much truth. Thanks so much for walking this out with me. We're going to keep rolling on in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Cannot wait for more. Um, cannot wait to see what's ahead. Cannot wait for another opportunity to glorify him, to dive in, to see more of his heart, to just be closer and closer to who he is. Cannot wait for more. Thanks so much for walking this out with me, growing with me, journeying through with me. It's beautiful. We're being rewarded, blessed by his presence, by just being changed and learning and growing in him. So good. So hit me up for more. We're just going to keep walking this thing out and diving in deeper, pressing in more. Cannot wait. Thanks so much. See you soon.